and uh, good afternoon everyone. Um, the presentation I will have this afternoon would mainly be focused on the Philippines and uh, this is so because it seems to me and it is already quite obvious to many that while we have very good um, learning institutions in the country and we have been told that we have uh, very good brains going around uh, in the country and yet uh, we remain the sick man in Asia. Why is this so? I would like to explore some uh, things that uh, we may want to explore further and find out whether we can find solutions to this problem. Social entrepreneurship. Now social entrepreneurship has been there since the 60s and the 70s. Even earlier, I would like to say that uh, the concept and the practice of social entrepreneurship has been uh, started even during the Industrial Revolution. Let's get into a few definitions. Entrepreneurship as against uh, the regular business uh, venture is mainly characterized by the opportunity-seeking character of entrepreneurs. Businessmen, many of them, are started, or our big Taiwans today, started as really entrepreneurs looking for opportunities and being able to harness those opportunities into a successful business venture. And those who succeeded them would be a little less of an entrepreneur, but still have that spirit of entrepreneurship. So the first thing is about opportunities. Second is innovation. How to find the innovative approach that would fit into the opportunity, that would match the opportunity. Without entrepreneurship, according to Sean Peter, there would not have been that rapid development in our society. Since the Industrial Revolution, the growth in our economies have been uh, very, very high. From 20 before the Industrial Revolution, it grew to 70%, 220%, 200%, and in the past, in the last 50 years or so, it had been 700%. That is the rapidity, the, the, the pace of growth because of entrepreneurship. So an entrepreneur is one who undertakes innovations, who finds innovations. But the other element is risk. Um, so easy for me to shift to the dialogue, but uh, yeah, <clears throat> um, risk is something that is, especially in entrepreneurship, is something that is a bit uh, difficult to translate. Why is that so? Uh, find out, try to think what is the equivalent in Filipino, the dialogue, the risk that is not Spanish. The closest to that is Pakitipag sa Kalaran. Venturing into the unknown something like that. But this is difficult to translate simply because we have not been used to it. We would like to remain in our comfort zones. So that is entrepreneurship. Now what is social entrepreneurship? Social entrepreneurship is entrepreneurship applied to the solving or addressing of social issues and problems. So a social entrepreneur is innovative, someone who takes risks, 
but creates mainly social value. As against a business entrepreneur creating financial value. But a very good social entrepreneur has a balance in the creation of both the financial value and the social value because without the financial value, the social value could not be sustained. So that is how we understand social entrepreneurship. Now, social entrepreneurship is not philanthropy. It is not coming out of generosity. It is a commitment. It is a career, if you like. Many would say, no, no, no. Uh, it's uh, something that is extracurricular. No, I don't think so. Social entrepreneurship is a worthwhile, enriching, and satisfying career. So it has, it is not altruism. No, it is not corporate social responsibility. Corporate social responsibility, we know. It's uh, a, uh, a project, a program of a business that to a certain degree um, how do you say? Um, compensates whatever damage or use or overuse that a corporation makes of um, natural or other resources. For example, Pepsi Cola. The CSR of Pepsi Cola has always to do with water. How about Levi's Strauss Foundation? It has always to do with supporting garment workers. Not necessarily those making the Levi's jeans, but they would support projects that uh, involve people in the garment industry. So that is the kind of, uh, that is what we call corporate social responsibility. Uh, an example that you would easily uh, relate to would be um, Ayala Foundation and Gawad Kalina. It's housing because Ayala Corporation is very big in real estate. So we know, for example, that uh, Makati South, is it? That's being built in the Kanduba, in the former Kanduba estate is owned by Ayala. Now, social entrepreneurship is also not corporate shared value. This is a very new thing. According to the Harvard Business Review, capitalism is under fire. This time, with the global economic crisis, the practice of capitalism and free enterprise has been under fire. And that has to be repaired. And one of the things that has been developed by Michael Porter is corporate shared value. Corporate shared value is still business focused, private profit focused, but involves more of the social sector and sharing some financial value with the, with the social sector and performing or creating as well social value. Contributing to society, uplifting those who are most depressed in the value chain. In a way, it is something similar to what they call HBC or hybrid value chain. These are two uh, concepts that are coming up uh, quite recently, and there are many similarities. There are two authors, different authors, to uh, corporate shared value and hybrid value chain. But I think there are quite a number of similarities that they have. For example, uh, one example of CSV is how um, 
how Nestle coffee uh, uh, production and processing is being done, where they go straight to the sources of the coffee beans and bring them in into their supply chain rather than having just what they call the management of the supply chain. They are now integrated into the whole supply chain of coffee to the Nestle Corporation. Still very new, very uh, new uh, concept. And this is being developed further by uh, these professors at the Harvard Business School. Now let's look at how we understand society. There are three systems in the economy, as we know. The private system, the private sector, we know that very well. The public sector, of course we know the public sector, they're always in the papers. And the social sector, or the community sector. Now, uh, the black economy is uh, the, it creates uh, financial value, but it runs against the legal uh, framework of the economy. So that is where smuggling is, that is where uh, um, trafficking, uh, money that is generated, wealth that is generated from trafficking is belong to the black economy. The more there is failure in the private and the public system, what happens is that the social sector, the community sector, takes the brunt, and the black economy widens. This is how the economic systems uh, move. So this is how the three systems work, or the principles that these three systems operate. In a perfect way, in a perfect way. So you have the motivation, it's financial value, which is profit, public order, human dignity. So these are the motivating the push factors for the dynamism of the three sectors. And the core value is profitability, quality of life, and social justice for the social sector. And we have resources, uh, very clearly uh, we know these resources. What is not very clear to many of us, especially in the Philippines nowadays, is what we call the commons. There are commons in any society, in any community, and those commons are supposed to be shared by everyone. For example, the lakes, the water systems. There are commons that should not be alienated and therefore they should be protected and be upheld as commons. But nowadays we know that a lot of the commons are now appropriated to whoever could afford them. So this is in the uh, perfect world. And uh, the measures of success we are also quite clear, quite uh, familiar, we're quite familiar with them. Uh, Net uh, present value or return on equity. For the public sector, it's GNP, it's uh, GDP. But in the social sector, it's the quality of life. To the, what is this country uh, next to Tibet, where they measure the, the gross national happiness? Bhutan. Bhutan. So there's some kind of a uh, overlap with uh, social measures of success. So but why do we focus on the social sector and social entrepreneurship? Because our world is not perfect. Because the market is inefficient. Because there is a greed of greed because the government is not doing its job and because the social sector, if they remain vulnerable, becomes very expensive. And why do we focus 
focus on agriculture or the agricultural sector because majority of the poor in the social sector are in the rural areas and mainly in agriculture. They lack access to the wealth creating assets and this is why there is so much poverty grinding poverty, some would say, because land, a very important asset, is not within the reach. Capital, no matter we talk of microfinance reaching to the rural areas, the 2020 uh, rule of the uh, banks, and not even effectively implemented the agri agra law. Technology. Technology is something very much foreign. When you think of technology, we're looking at ICT, we're thinking of a lot of high-tech things that are not in the um, or uh, environment of the rural people and access to market. The Philippines has one of the most moribund market markets. The market highways are crisscrossing just like our roads. You have rice in Mindoro that is sold or bought by uh, rice traders in Pangasinan and brought to Laguna or to Divisoria. Why can't the Mindoro rice go straight to Divisoria? Because the market transactions or the business transactions take place between personal private contacts. Unlike in other countries where you have centralized markets. For example, in the Netherlands, Flowers are bought and sold at the flower market. Everything, everything uh, about flowers are in the flower market. But here we don't have very clear flower market. Where is our flower market? It's in Dangwa. Why? Because flowers used to be uh, traditionally coming from uh, the Cordilleras and the most resilient bus company is Dangwa. And so flowers are brought by the Dangwa bus and so a flower market flower around the Dangwa bus station. That's how the market is developed. But that is not so in other countries. And there is very low priority for rural development, rural projects, rural enterprises, rural capital. Look at the newspapers. What do you see in the newspaper? Very seldom do we see something that has to do with agriculture. If there are agriculture uh, news, it would be about banana plantations or um, the, the Land conversion so that Jetropa is can be planted. So that what? Well, so that uh, we would have um, biofuels and so on. But productivity and uh, innovation that would benefit majority of the rural people and farmers are seldom in the newspaper. So what we have done in our organization, we have been very cognizant of rural uh, underdevelopment. Uh, Unlad Kabayan, as was uh, described by Julian earlier, uh, works with migrant workers. But eventually, over the years, we realized that if we don't, focus, deep focus on rural enterprises and rural development, 
we will continue to be exporting workers abroad. And we know that, I mean, logically, our job generation cannot be dependent on the opportunities and job creation in other countries because we have almost no control over these jobs and over the conditions of the country. And so what do we see right now? A return of many of our migrant workers. I mean, our government doesn't know what to do. The only way they know is to find other markets for our labor. I was just uh, attending the uh, uh, labor and employment agenda. And I was surprised that from among the civil society organizations, uh, most of us came from the migrant support sector. We were outnumbering the trade unions. And I said, why is this so? Is it because we are now again focusing on labor migration? And it was true. The focus was again on labor migration. What do we do with the returning migrants? can only ring our hands. And not only North Africa and uh, Middle East are migrants coming from. We also have Japan. We have how many workers in Japan? There are about half a million Filipinos in Japan. And uh, half of that would be migrant workers, mainly uh, Japanese descendants and Mekijin. The rest would be uh, undocumented workers and marriage migrants. So especially those in the, in the northern part of Japan, many of them are marriage migrants. According to the Japanese, the main problem in the rural area is three W's. Uh, water, way, or road, and wife. Mm -hmm. So they have been importing wives. Mm -hmm. So what we did uh, was to encourage migrant workers while they're still abroad to pull their savings together and invest where in the communities where there are opportunities. So a group of migrants in Taiwan uh, put up a rice center whether they uh, have a rice meal, they uh, work in the bidding, and uh, because they could not uh, have a regular supply of palai for milling, because uh, rice or palai was already being bought by the traders, because the traders provide the capital. And so they have no choice but to sell it to traders. And so they had to go into trading. And so they had to provide farm inputs, farm capital, and provide other services like solar drying and uh, plowing and so on and so forth, so that they can build a clientele. And so now it's so that it's struggling, it's there. And they have uh, a return uh, migrant worker from Taiwan who's managing it. And they provide jobs to about 23 workers and uh, provide farm credit to 150 farming households. So, this is the kind of uh, business in the Matinao, uh, Surigao, the North. And the migrant worker, return migrant worker, keeps on coming back to us saying, can we become more of a business than a social enterprise? Because we want to earn more. Well, that's an ongoing uh, debate and it's another story. Another group of migrants tried an integrated micro agribusiness farm. It's a five hectare farm that they bought in Bukidnon. Now it is surrounded by uh, two streams, and so they have quite a bigger area of a public easement. 
And so it comes up to get, together with the public is that something like uh, seven, eight hectares all together. And he lived, you know, like this. And so they had to use salt. Uh, we're all familiar with salt, no? And so, uh, but salt was done very manually. You know, uh, what do they call it when they have to use the thing to, uh, to keep the, the, that uh, terrace level? So, nothing to do with all this CNC kind of uh, equipment. They have to use like one that uh, is used by the carpenter to. So they have a port, they have cassava, they have uh, here in this, uh, oh, I was told that there is something here. So on the slopes, they have uh, crops, and then on the, on the level part, they have the vegetables. So they have, uh, sometimes they have bell pepper. Um, they have learned to <coughs> So on these slopes, that is where they have the corn. And in between the, the slopes, the Terrace, they plant hedges for uh, as uh, fodder for the goats. And on the uh, flat area, they have the vegetables, and they are now uh, learning to track um, what vegetables uh, fetch high price at what month. And so they uh, move back how many uh, weeks, how many days, or how many months. Uh, before harvest, and that's when they start to plant. But of course, uh, they have been very challenged by the continuing rains in, uh, since uh, November of last year until now. The rains have not really stopped, and so uh, the farm is having problems. So they have been saying that perhaps we need to uh, raise more capital and put up uh, greenhouses. And they have, uh, oh sorry, what happened here? Okay, so they have also different lifestyles. Now, um, there is a, uh, a, an interesting way of running the, the farm. Each uh, unit is a business unit. So the livestock for the pigs is you have a, you have a business plan for that. And uh, it has its own cycle. So with the, the chickens, the poultry, it has also its cycle. And so it's a separate business and integrated only in the management. And at the same time, we have what we call the bio, bio organic uh, system established. So that the corn is bought by the livestock. And the livestock sells its uh, manure and biogas to the uh, and so on, that kind of a relationship. And so it's a bit challenging considering that it's, it's, these are micro uh, agribusiness. What the, the farm is trying to find out is how much productivity can be made in a small farm and how many households could it support. So those are uh, something that we uh, try to convince the microbes. 
with ethics. Not to learn, but also going to experiment. And there's a means to experiment when they finish. Anyway, so. Now, another one is vegetable gardening. This is in the rural area. But these two are in the urban areas. Uh, I think you are familiar with container gardening. So the, during the undoy, one of the things that uh, people were looking for in many of the uh, evacuation centers was fresh food, fresh vegetables to put into the hundreds and thousands, tens of thousands of noodles that were distributed during the uh, in the relief and the relief operations. So they said, hey, where can we get these vegetables? And so they said, well, we can start planting vegetables. We'll bring some pots here and um, If you look closely, these are what the uh, San Mateo uh, people, or Tetra Pats. Uh, they are from Tetra Pats. They used to be made into bags. But you know, bags, they don't sell uh, very much in the sense that you sell a bag now, you can't sell again the next day, you know? Uh, or you, you won't be able to uh, sell more because they last and last and last. So what they did was to make them into containers to grow the vegetables. So these are the kanto here, and down here are still the lettuce. And now they have been selling not only the vegetables, they sell the whole thing. Bring to SM with the pots, with the vegetables. It's a vegetable, it's not fully grown or half grown or full grown, they're sold. And so when you buy them, you can get a few lettuce that's enough for your family and then you can just leave it there. It continues to grow. So this is something that was uh, developed. It's not something new. The innovation there is that you know, it becomes uh, mobile and it has become commercialized. Virgin coconut oil. It used to be the the craze, maybe one two years ago. Now uh, the the market is awash with virgin coconut oil you know, everywhere. So the group in Linamon in Lanao del Norte, because uh, BTI said this is a very good promising a business going to virgin coconut oil only to get into you know, a, uh, a very steep market competition and of course women very difficult to get into the competition especially the rural women they have difficulty making sales work. so they go to fairs but what they have done was they uh, but they still sell this thing, uh, the oil. It's very good. I use them too. They have uh, produced, diversified the product into massage oil. So you will find that they also get into this massage oil thing. And uh, what they did was to get in touch with uh, massage clinics so that they can be sold there. So you know, when your massage oil is so good, what happens is that the massagista uh, promotes the massage oil to the customer. So then the massagista gets a part of the sale and so on. So that's how they, they do it. And uh, apart from massage oil, they have also uh, what they call um, cream. Cream for the for the food and cream for the what else I I don't know uh, for what 
but they put a lot of different herbs. So you have a cream and a massage oil with ampullae leaves, and so on and so on. So I said just keep on talking about it so that people won't be, uh, get tired using this massage oil and creams. And food processing. In Davao, the fruit is really abundant, especially during this time, uh, during the Kadayawa time, which is around uh, August, September, October. And they come very, very cheaply. And bananas are everywhere out there, even here, I'm sure. So it's really adding value to this but there's a lot of uh, debate and discussion here, disagreements even, because Filipinos are not used to eating processed foods. Probably dried mangoes would be uh, something more to the taste. But dried pineapple, a bit of the middle class, maybe upper class for the fruit cake and so on. But you won't be able to sell it as a uh, something uh, finger food uh, to the regular uh, market on the street. But they're doing well in the banana chips because the banana chips are processed further outside the country. In Europe, for example, they cook it with white chocolate, and they're really good, really expensive. So, we have mountains of banana chips here. It's, the challenge is, of course, uh, standards and quality. So, these women have been trained in the good manufacturing practices of GMP, HASA, and all these uh, uh, skills and attitude and habits behavior. What we discovered was that since they could not, not all of them, because we trained something like 30 women or 50 women, not all of them could be absorbed in the food processing center that we have in Korea. But they, we learned, they easily get the jobs in the other food processing businesses because they don't have to be trained anymore. They already know GMP. And all that. So we said, ah, employable skills. Yes, we can do that too. Employable skills in the manufacturing in agribusiness. Now, coconut husks. This is, I think, where I am, I don't know, I won't say I'm in love, but I'm very challenged. Coconut husks, we throw them away. They stick to the corals, they kill the corals. They plant the water leaves, they're a menace. But once you decorticate them, they become fiber. They can become twine, they can be woven into geonets, they are used for soil erosion control. In many countries, Japan, China, Taiwan, Korea, Australia, Germany, US, they are used. In the Philippines, you have to say stop the Department of Public Works and Highways. Why? Because the 10% of cocoa work is very small. You know, the usual 10% uh, of every purchase. This is small because it's cheap. So they're not very excited in using Geonets. That is a challenge. So what the business had done was to bake them and sell them abroad. In fact, the demand is very, very high, especially today. There is some uh, discussion, meetings, talks about Japan might be interested to increase their importation of geonet and dust to absorb 
whatever the customer absorbs. They are made into fiber. Fiber is produced this one. That's going to be come like this. And what is it? Silicon beds. You know that bed where the elephant steps on? That is made of fiber. And that is made in China. China does not produce fiber at all. They don't have coconut trees except for decorations. Or in the southern part of China, but they're not in commercial quantity. But China now produces, processed, exportable goods made of fiber, competing with a traditional exporter, India. India is the biggest producer of cocoa fiber. Uh, in, uh, I think, every single mountain you can see in Kerala covered with coconut trees. So this is actually in Kerala, in India. And also this one. And the technology is not that complex. But we don't have it here. What do we have? We have this. So we will buy this from somewhere else. In Vietnam, about 10 years ago, I was in uh, uh, what is the capital of Vietnam again? Hanoi. In Hanoi, I saw a person coming down a big store carrying something huge that just went cut, cut, cut. And he brought it home in his uh, ritual. It looked like this. In fact, it was this. It was like this. And that is what the Vietnamese use. And this is very good for hospital beds because they are cool and they prevent bed sores. But we do not produce that in commercial quantity in the Philippines. Why? And the dust. This is a, uh, you know, coconut has, you have fiber in it. And the dust, when compacted, can look like this. It can be made into organic fertilizer. It is a soil conditioner. When you mix it with the soil, it absorbs water and keeps the water in. And so you don't have to use so much water. And this is a photo that I saw in Geneva. And I went to the greenhouse or to the farm in Geneva. They have this. It's about as big as a, big, a little bigger than a laptop computer. And when you put water, then it starts to absorb and starts to grow. And then they have holes. And into those holes, you put the seeds. And then it will grow and then you will have these cherry tomatoes. And they are layered. And so in one greenhouse, you have five to six stories of this type. And they have small tubes going around for watering. And all they have to do is open it and close it. Now, what we did here is we we use the same principle, but we use the um, you know the intravenous 
so you can regulate the flow of the water. So you can go to your work and then just open it and then come back in the afternoon the water will keep on flowing. So it's the same principle to drip irrigation. So these are the benefits of social enterprises and entrepreneurship, especially in the rural area. Now, the rural people are very, very non-entrepreneurial. They want fast returns. They are not willing to wait. They would say, I must sell. But it is because the need is so urgent. And so there is a need to develop entrepreneurial mindset. But entrepreneurial mindset will have to come along with other things. Like you have capital that can be patient. It's not capital that you have to pay back tomorrow immediately. So those are some of the barriers to social entrepreneurship in agriculture. Access of methods. Access to technology. This is something, a machine that cleans up or smoothens bamboos. Now you know that we grow bamboos almost anywhere in the country. And bamboos are resilient if we know how to, if we have the technology. Because we do that. But when you clean up the bamboos, you need machines like this. Where to get those machines? We have beautiful, plenty flowing water, but they don't get to the houses. You have to get to this kind of thing in the rural areas. And this water does not get to the farms. Irrigation is a big problem in the rural areas. This is a very crude feeding. But you know, in the Philippines, a majority of our livestock industry is back here. It's 80% of our livestock is produced household here. What do we do? This is a challenge. business, they have to bear the cost of development, farm to market rules, which is a crucial, a critical element in productivity. So you will find that transport, we have Habal Habal right now, I don't know, you are familiar with Habal Habal? Uh, in Japanese, they are amazed by the way we have developed different uh, ways of using a motorcycle. So we now have what is called in Mindanao uh, Skylab. You know Skylab? Who knows about Skylab? Know that? It's a very dangerous, precarious way of transportation. You have a motorcycle, single motorcycle, then you have two, uh, four, uh, what is this? A cross, and then you would have two sacks of rice here, and you have one, uh, one uh, can of kerosene there, and one uh, gallon of tuba on the other side, and you have two babies here, and so on. And it climbs up you are one in that mining area. That's the kind of transportation that we have. I challenge you to get it. It's exciting. <laughs> but at the macro level, we have big problems. We have an economic crisis that is not 
easing up. They said before it was going to be a V, golden up. Or maybe a double V, W. Down, up, down, up. And then they said maybe it's an L. Down and and it seems to be it's the L. This thing. Not because they have not tried to work things out, but there are so many factors that economists and MBA people just could not have a handle. Who would have a handle, for example, in what's happening in North Africa? So according to uh, Warren, the derivatives are financial weapons of mass destruction. So that's a macro thing. But macro and micro now are not as uh, as different. The macro immediately impacts on the micro and the other way around. And we have an environmental crisis. When we talk about the excesses of the private sector, this is what uh, the Financial Times was uh, showing in their uh, cartoons. And yes, this is the mining communities in the world. And this is the flooding in And this is Central Luzon during a long drought season. And of course, you know that. And there has been a recent landslide uh, um, again in Lake. We have a crisis in Manus. When one goes to the mall, one asks one question when you see something nice. What would be the question that would come into your mind? Huh? How much? Okay, it comes. How much? Well, what should be the price to how much? Hmm? Prior to how much? Yes. Do I need it? That is a question that should be asked. First. Do I need it? not going to happen to me. I'm too educated. 
our migrant workers would say. To educate them and to scale, it did not happen to me. So we have with the excesses of the private sector and the media of the public sector, we have a social sector that is very much marginalized. Not only in our country, but also in other countries like this is in the US. And you can see the contrast of a um, this is a what what kind of part is? <laughs> Rolls Royce. You know this Rolls Royce? This one is either made of silver or gold. When you touch it, what happens to it? It goes down and the alarm goes off. So getting from point A to point B, you can go in a Rolls Royce or you can go in this. So again, Financial Times said poverty is a weapon of mass destruction. And this is the social justice. It is not about democracy, my friends. In Tunisia, it is not about democracy. It was about What's his name? I escapes me. I'm who assess him. Who was he finished? Uh, he was a graduate, uh, but he couldn't find a job. So he ended up selling vegetables in a cart, just like any of our chemical uh, selling uh, in the streets. And the police then took away his goods and he went back and forth to the police station to take back his goods because that's the only thing that he had between him and poverty. But he was made fun of. He was even kid. So what did he do? He put gasoline on himself and light. And that sparked the whole unrest in Tunisia that went to Egypt, that went to Bahrain, that went to Libya, that went to Jordan, to Oman, to Germany. So this is what means poverty is a weapon of mass destruction. What do we need to do? A development paradigm. How do we develop that? Where does it come from? We need economic development, but we need social progress. And we need environmental responsibility so that we have a viable, livable, and a fair world. But because of poverty, we have this number of people going out of the country. They were leaving, they were there, they're coming back. What do we do? This is in Cebu City, um, capital. Cebu City has a, uh, a sister city, Kaohsiung, in Taiwan. And so Taiwan, Kaohsiung, Taiwan, invites workers from Cebu City. And so they are fine to be up for jobs. And in Hong Kong. And now they're coming back. But they are coming back, not in the cities. Many of them will go back to the world. And we have to overcome the barriers to social entrepreneurship, especially in agriculture. High cost of capital, how much is the interest of capital? And yet, we have very liquid banks, but banks that cannot lend money without hard collateral. And farmers do not have that kind of collateral very high cost of energy and it's going up again and again and again. We have the highest corporate tax. In that meeting we had with the Department of Labor, they were debating about the corporate tax. The Department of Finance said 
no, we cannot lower the corporate tax because we will lose revenue. At the same time, the PTI says, we have to lower the corporate tax because we need the foreign investors to come in. And so that debate is going on year after year. So what can we do? We have to promote and invest in social entrepreneurship. We have to popularize the benefits of social entrepreneurship, especially in the We should reward social entrepreneurs. And we have to look very seriously on how our economy is managed. We cannot just sit back here, especially you young people. For me, I'm on the way out. <laughs> you are still going to rise. So these are some of the things that we as social entrepreneurs I challenge you that social entrepreneurship is a career. Here are the issues, social issues, and the opportunities. I just read one article of this new, uh, newly awarded agriculture uh, vegetable producer, Agri Merchant. You heard about it? He produces vegetables for the uh, and supplies in the big malls in Machuni. And uh, he has very innovative ways of uh, producing these vegetables. He has small farms, big farms. He produces lettuce, packs them well, brings them to uh, malls, and so on. Restaurants, and so on. The demand is high, according to him. And he is proposing to us to identify land that are possible. And I said, no, we cannot agree to that. If you want, link up with the farmers. That is the only thing that the farmers have, and we are going to take it away from them. What will we leave them? So, that is something that we have to think about. Food security. It's not only food production, and it's not only profit production, creation. There has to be income generated, financial value generated that comes with dignity. It cannot be money alone. Alternative energy, I challenge you. We produce biogas in India, in uh, in the villages they use the manure of the cow, isn't it? Use it for fuel. In China, they um, grow pigs for the biogas, not for the meat. We produce biogas here. But those who know a very good way and cost-effective way of producing biogas do not share it with the rest of the people in the rural areas. They want to sell the technology what? Sell it? Well, it can be had very cheaply. Why can't the DOST and the Department of Agriculture? They have been publishing it in their magazine. That biogas can be packed in these blue things and used for fuel and for light. Why not popularize that? Anyone here go into that business? That is going to be a very good social enterprise. If I were younger, I would go into it. But right now, my hands are tied with this pop of fire. We have a lake. It produces a lot of fish. But there are some barriers productivity of the small fishermen. We're working on it, but we're on the other side of the lake, cleaning up and so on. 
looking at this water disease and so on. You are on this side of the And I think if we move around, with more people around the lake, that lake is going to be more productive than it is now. <clears throat> so these are some of the issues and opportunities. And there is a lot more. The only limit is your imagination. So this is where we make this lecture pass. So during the Udoi, there was a lot of uh, cash forwards and so on that was uh, being distributed around. So uh, people said, oh, why should we not in, why don't we invest it into assets rather than use them to buy food? So they use them to grow vegetables. So now they have food one, two years after the relief distribution. And uh, so 